With those words fresh upon our lips, let us now uh, turn to our scripture reading for this morning's sermon. Uh, we return again to the book of James, between Hebrews and 1 Peter. Between Hebrews and 1 Peter, you find James. And before we read, please join me in asking for God's blessing upon his word. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege is ours to be with you again today, and what a privilege is ours not to imagine who you are or what you have done, to imagine what you are doing, but to hear from you uh, your, your, your truth and your goodness and the glory that you have in store for your people. Oh, that we would now hear from you your word. May your Holy Spirit uh, open our hearts to receive what you have for the churches, for our Grace Church, for each of us here. You see our hearts, O oh Father. We pray that you would now work and, and provide and do just as, act, just as you know most, is most needed for each of us. Remember and visit her alike, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1, we're going to read right through verse 18 this morning. Please follow along. Uh, this is God's word. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking and nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has, given, when it con when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my fellow brothers. Every good, good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So far the reading of God's word. Please be seated. Beloved congregation, if you've, if you've been around Christianity for a while, you know that the book of James has had a long and complicated history within the church. In fact, early on, very early on, there was enough uncertainty about its author and purpose that James was the last or nearly the last book added into the canon of Scripture. But even then, while James was loved by many, others were still unsure of its message. Even during the Reformation, Martin Luther famously called James an epistle of straw. Weak, at least he, he saw it to be weak in its ministry of Christ and the gospel. 
Since then, of course, James has been happily received by Christians. But truth be told, I mean, at least in my experience, many Christians still really struggle to relate the message of James to Christ and the gospel. It's almost as if in reading through other parts of the New Testament, we're hearing about Jesus and the grace of our salvation, and then we, then we turn the page, and now we're reading about something else. We're reading James. As we heard last week, however, the, the key to, to understanding this letter is to recognize how it is grounded from the very beginning, the very opening statement, James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's that's the fundamental ground of James. He identifies himself as belonging to God, specifically belonging to Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. As we often say, I am not my own, but I belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's where James begins, and that's where and how James continues, verse after verse. In that sense, James is full of Jesus. James brings to us the wisdom of Jesus, the wisdom of Christ. We could summarize some of those introductory matters of this this New Testament letter in terms of the author being James, the brother of Jesus, the audience being the church, particularly as it it was dispersed among the nations of that time and place, facing, um, if not physical suffering, certainly social suffering, economic suffering, being marginalized in their society for the sake of Jesus. The author is James, the audience, the church. The message is wisdom, specifically the wisdom of Christ. As Proverbs comes and applies the word of God and the wisdom of of Old Testament literature. Now James comes and applies the word and wisdom of Christ through the New Testament. That was some of what we heard last week. How the wisdom of God has now become the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of Christians, the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of the cross. That's, That's really the message of James And this morning what we do is continue our study now, going a bit deeper into this wonderful letter, this wonderful book, by considering now not so much the author, audience, message, but now more of its its content, its main themes. This morning the main theme of blessing, the blessing of James, or the blessed man of James. There are some parallels between the Old Testament blessed man and the New Testament blessed man. But as we would expect with the coming of Jesus and ministry of the new covenant, there's a, there's a lot of rich, wonderful, exciting development. Development from old to new. Let's begin again with verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Notice that the the blessed man here is one who remains steadfast under trial. The blessed man is steadfast and remains steadfast under trial. That trial described as a test, then, in verse 13, a temptation. The blessed man of James is the Christian who loves God at the commencement of faith, the beginning of new life, 
and throughout the end of life. The blessed man of James is the Christian who loves God in times of joy and knows the love of God in the greatest of sorrow. Now let's be clear. James is not saying that the non-blessed man will become the blessed man through trials and testing and temptation. But rather what? James is saying that the one who is blessed will be blessed, will experience a further blessing through trials and temptations. We might put it like this in the language of Colossians, that those who have been united to Christ by faith will share more of Christ through the trials and testings of our faith, even through the temptations that inevitably come. Maybe a couple of illustrations would be helpful here, maybe one from marriage. If you think about a man and a woman, they are not married as the result of the trials that they experience, but rather they are blessed in the union of marriage that they have been been given to know. They are blessed in the union of marriage as their love grows through trials and testing and temptation. Let me say it again. A man and a woman do not become married as the result of trials, but within the context of of the union established between them, their love grows through trials. Likewise, our children. I don't say to my kids, uh, I'll be your father after you grow up. That's That's nonsense. What do we say to our kids? But as you grow up, as you go through the maturing of life, my love and our love will grow and mature through the struggle. These trials, these testings, these these temptations that James refers to. For for his context, his audience, we can be confident that there was a certain kind of uh, social, political, economic uh, type of persecution that they were experiencing. Maybe not yet uh, full-out physical persecution. Maybe not yet the kind of persecution Stephen experienced. But, but at a minimum, a social, economic, political persecution where they were marginalized in their society because of the name of Jesus, because of their worshiping of Jesus through the word and the sacraments. What they had known before, so much of it had been lost. And, and we, we can easily imagine how that would have been a trial and a testing of faith. And it's not hard to imagine that those kinds of external things quickly find a a place, a foothold within our hearts. And those social, economic, political trials become emotional, spiritual trials. As we begin to wonder what God is doing, as we begin to wonder whether or not God is somehow himself beginning to complicate our lives. What James is calling upon us to do is to reflect upon these these trials, testing, and temptations and to think about them as a way that God works for the strengthening of our life. Again, think a bit like this, that that trials of life do not create life for us, but rather strengthen life like resistance in the gym, like resistance in exercise. 
Likewise, testing. These testings described here, they do not give life, but help us to evaluate what needs improvement in the life that we've already been given. And in this way, the temptations that we face are not a means for us to gain or get new life, but rather that through which we express, strengthen, and improve the union and life we already share with Jesus Christ. These trials, testings, and temptations of James then become ways that God works to bring about a greater reality of the baptism we share, a greater participation in the broken body and shed blood of Jesus through the gospel. In this way, the Christian is brought to a greater sharing of Christ or or not. How about another illustration, this one with a bit of a a, a classroom vibe. I was thinking about the X and Y graphs that some of our kids do at school. The X X and the Y graphs. the, one, the, the, the graph that I, I most readily comes to mind for me is a straight line. You know, it could be just a straight horizontal line, I suppose, but usually when I was doing those graphs, it was, it was uh, X and Y on a straight, straight line uh, of growth. We can, we can plot and graph life. If we think about Jesus, for example, and we would try to plot and graph the suffering that Jesus experienced in life, the the trials, the testing, the temptations. From the moment of his conception, it was real. And day by day, it became really, really hard. Until what began as real suffering became the greatest of personal suffering. Of, of being forsaken by the one he most knew and loved as he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, that's how we might graph the suffering of Jesus from his earliest of days towards the end, that straight line of increased suffering. Now, if we would graph the righteousness of Jesus, it would be the same, wouldn't it? The very righteousness of Jesus would have begun from the moment of conception as good and then moved from good to great, moving from good to the greatest expression of righteousness. Along the way is the reality of love, of love. Likewise, a greater experience of love. How about you and me? Even in Christ, even in Christ, even in union with Jesus Christ, the Christian's life is not like that. Whether we seek to plot out our suffering, our righteousness, our life, we don't have that that straight increase of, of experience, do we? Even in Christ, the ordinary Christian experiences a lot of messiness. Just as the ordinary Christian heart is a really messy place of sin and misery, so also when when two sinners say, I do, in Christian marriage, what happens? But you take two messy hearts and you bring them together. And so just as the ordinary Christian marriage is a bit messy, so also the ordinary Christian household is a bit messy. And if that's true, well, shouldn't we also anticipate that with a bit messy hearts and homes, we have a bit messy schools and churches? As one of my mentors has said, if you ever find a perfect church, don't go there because you're sure to mess it up. And he was right. He was right. While the life of Christ was this, was this line increasing from ever, ever increasing, 
Ours is a messy twist and turn along the way. Of course, as Christians, we celebrate the justification that is ours in Christ, never increasing or diminishing, but a present eternal reality that the sinner has been justified once and for all. We celebrate the justification that is ours in Christ even as we face the daily trials of sanctification, the tests of our faith, the temptations that sin bring. And we do so. James wants us to do so as the blessed for a greater blessing, as the loved for a greater sharing of love, from the, from the joy of new life in Jesus Christ to the greater joy that is to come in Christ. As it says in another place, from one degree of glory to another. But it's not a straight line. It's not a straight line. The Christian life faces so many twists and turns that we may be tempted to doubt God himself. That brings us to our second point this morning. Let no one say when he is tempted, verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. What is James doing? He's developing the need for wisdom. The letter of James begins with an appeal to our trials and the need for wisdom. And, and this same beginning and introduction is restated with an appeal to trials and the, and the need for wisdom. He's saying that the blessed man is blessed with wisdom. The blessed man is blessed with wisdom. The one in union with Christ through faith shares not only in the word of Christ, the gospel, also the wisdom of Christ and the cross. Remember earlier in the letter, after speaking about the trials and testing of faith, in chapter 1, verse 2, James goes right, right to the, the, the appeal to wisdom, saying, ask God for wisdom, emphasizing the need for us to grow in wisdom. And he does so here again because he wants us to see that without a maturing of faith into a growing of wisdom, we will think that the testing of our faith is from God himself. We'll come to think that we are being tempted by God. And what happens when we think that way? We will begin to question the love of God. And we will begin to question our relationship with God. Oh, I've been there in various ways. And as I walked with the saints, I know that many of you have been there in various ways. When the trial and testing and temptations of life come, we can find ourselves so weakened, so weary, that we wonder, where is God? But James comes and he says that God is not only with you, God is ever-present, lovingly allowing, lovingly allowing the, the trials of life, even the temptations that come. If he didn't do that, then God would be either a pro, a, a, like a computer programmer who puts in place a program and hits send, stands back and just lets everything follow in line throughout history. God would either be a computer programmer or he would be a slaveholder. 
forcing our wills to comply unto his own. But through the lens of James and the wisdom that he calls us to pursue, we come to see that God is not only reigning, he is also presently with us, lovingly allowing the freedom of trials, even temptation, not himself bringing those temptations because he never woos us into temptation. That is not the place of God, but of sin and of Satan, isn't it? And so the blessed man then will seek the wisdom of God. The blessed man, James says, will seek to understand these nuances and distinctions that we would understand and that we would even rejoice. It's good to ask, is it an appeal to the wisdom of Proverbs? Is that where James is going, calling upon us to go back to Proverbs? And the surprising answer is no. You see, Proverbs helps us to understand how God has established and preserves the created order in a fallen world. Proverbs comes and it says, this is how the world works. Proverbs says, listen to me, learn from me, and and you will gain the wisdom to prosper among your peers. In that sense, we might say Proverbs is the wisdom of common grace with anticipation of the redemption to come. James is not calling us to go back to Proverbs, but rather what James is doing is calling us to consider the word of God in Christ and the wisdom of Christ and the cross, we might call that the wisdom of saving grace. If Proverbs is the wisdom of common grace, the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of James is saving grace. The wisdom of saving grace. I think of it like this, that Jesus in the incarnation steps into the world of Proverbs. He embraces it and then speaks towards a spiritual flourishing. Not at the expense of our physicality. Jesus, in the incarnation, embraces it and then speaks to a spiritual flourishing. Jesus says, listen to me, and the Holy Spirit will grant unto you the very riches of heaven. Jesus, you see, then, is speaking about the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom that that celebrates what it is to be justified. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. It is the wisdom that celebrates our justification, And it is the wisdom that celebrates our sanctification. For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. And so must we. Because it is through the cross that we die to sin while living in grace and glory. Another pastor, teacher, professor named Richard Gaffin wrote about this wisdom of Christ, speaking about the wisdom of the cross. He calls it the usefulness of the cross. And in, and in, and in classic Gaffin language, he says that the, that the preeminent sign of eschatology is the cross of Jesus Christ upon Christianity. Drawing from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he writes that the very essence of Christian existence is dying and yet living, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. (laughs) James says the wise, the blessed man will have the wisdom to understand this. 
Our children don't have that yet. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons why in Reformed churches we baptize our children, a sign of their union with Christ, and then we're patient in our discipleship uh, towards the table because it takes time to understand this wisdom of Christ and the cross, doesn't it? It takes time for us to understand the true power of his broken body and shed blood. Our prayer as parents and as elders is that we would walk with our little ones, helping them grow and mature in the faith that they've been given, that they can see something of the wisdom they're called to with Jesus. James says that the blessed man will understand this, that that we might put it in terms of the negative and the positive of the cross and our sanctification. The negative and the positive of the cross and our sanctification. The negative is described in verse 14. Verse 14, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. It's almost as if he's saying, you have and will experience this. And as you grow as Christians, you're going to experience it with greater intensity. He's speaking to you and me here, isn't he? I know you know this. I know you feel this. I do. He says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. The Christian life does not become easier. It increases in its intensity as we get closer to glory. Wisdom knows this. Wisdom knows the way of our trial, our testing, and especially temptation. As with Adam and Eve, that temptation, it begins where? It begins in the heart. As we are lured and enticed by our desires. And then, as with David and Bathsheba, Desire, what does it do? It conceives and gives birth to sin. It may begin with a passion or desire for bad things, but it also may begin with a passion or desire for good things that we then elevate into kind of ultimate things. Those things giving birth to sin. And at first, that that sin, oh, it feels like the very essence of life, doesn't it? We see it, we taste it, we experience it, and our soul rejoices. Ah, but not for long. Because in time, As that sin grows, what does it give? But it gives death. It gives birth to death. Sin promises glory, and it gives hell. It does not bring us the joy of Christ and salvation, but rather the misery of Satan, of damnation. And the blessed man knows this. The blessed man seeks the wisdom to understand the temptations faced, seeks the wisdom to overcome those temptations, and even to rejoice through them. I know you think that's just odd-sounding language, but haven't we just experienced it this morning? where we have come through a hard week full of trials and testing and temptations, where we enter into the very holy presence of God and we get a sense of our own sin, our own guilt, our own misery. And what do we do? But, but we confess that sin and look by faith to Jesus and celebrate, celebrate how he has brought us through the trials and testing and temptation. 
The blessed man knows this because he is wise. And the blessed man knows he grows in that wisdom because of God. The blessed are blessed by God. Remember again the negative and the positive of our sanctification. If the negative of sanctification is dealing with the death of sin, the positive is looking to the life of righteousness, the gift of God in Christ. That's what James is doing here. He's reminding us that God is not the one who tempts us, but God is there ever present to uphold us and to bless us. The blessed man is blessed by God. The blessed man is not blessed by the work of our hands, but the work of God in the hands of Christ. Verse 17, he says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James is saying here that, that the blessed man is blessed by God, the giver of every good and perfect gift. And to explain this, what's he do? But he draws upon language of the Old Testament, particularly the words and phrases of, of Genesis and creation. And then Exodus, the word of truth. And then Leviticus, the first fruits of being in communion with God. And all of it for us in Christ. James says that the blessed man is blessed by the Father of lights, none other than God the Father, our Creator. James says that the blessed man is blessed by the word of truth, none other than the word incarnate, our Lord and Savior Jesus, with whom we have been brought forth from death into righteousness and life. James says that the blessed man is blessed by the Spirit with whom we are a kind of first fruits of new creation. A new humanity of the new heavens and the new earth here, now, light shining amongst the death and dying of the world. James is helping us then to remember the words of Jesus, who said that whoever would come after me must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me from the cross to glory. As we feel the negative aspects of that cross, congregation, as we feel the negative aspects of sanctification, let us pray for the wisdom to understand, the wisdom to overcome, the wisdom to persevere. Doing so, remembering that it's not a zero-sum game as the negatives are overwhelmed by the positives. The joy of sharing and the suffering of Christ and the glory to come. Through James, let us remember the words of Jesus. Through James, let us remember the words of Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you have the, the wisdom of Christ the wisdom of the cross, sharing his sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is finally revealed. Oh, beloved, I know that you come from a week of trials and of testing and of temptation. 
Let us not doubt God in these moments. Let us rather bring our cares, our our anxieties. Let us bring him our sin and our misery. Let us bring it to Christ and leave those things at the cross. And let us go forth now rejoicing in our justification and by his grace even rejoicing through the sanctification we experience, knowing that, that in him it is the true sharing of a far greater glory to come. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word, and we thank you that that word you have spoken long ago has been fulfilled through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Oh, how we thank you for the word of Christ, the gospel, and and we pray now that you would grant the Holy Spirit to help us know, understand these things, and grow with that Christ-like wisdom to embrace the cross from day to day, that we would have the grace to die to ourselves, our own personal hopes and desires, and then live more in Christ, knowing his will, embracing his will. Grant us comfort and confidence along the way. Grant us, O Lord, we pray, to be faithful. For Jesus' sake, amen.